it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I'm being forced to act out a kid's cartoon for children with serious issues. Even before I was kidnapped, it was already the worst night of my life. Freshly fired from my job as a pizza girl and too scared to go home and tell my parents I was in fact a waste of space, I found myself where every other 19-year-old kid alt with no life and barely any cash would go. A club. This place wasn't exactly the height of New York, and the outside smelled of piss, but it was a distraction, and I really needed a distraction. I needed to not think about my life that was slowly crumbling apart, coming apart by the seams. I didn't want to think about what Mom's expression would be when I told her I was fired, again. In the mess which was my brain, the only possible cure to my shitty mood and not feeling anything, at least for the next few hours, was alcohol and dancing. I needed to dance and sing and drink and whatever, to forget that I was a disgrace to society. The pizza job was shit anyway. It was meager cash and the pizza smelled like bark. I'd like to say it wasn't an accident when I spilled coke all over a customer, because I hated the owners. They treated their staff, who all happened to be like me, broke-ass college dropouts, like dirt. But it was my fault. I was too busy dancing to the radio, not really paying much attention. The customer, a woman in maybe her mid-forties with straw-like hair and stains on her blouse, had been heading over to me, probably to yell at me for something out of my control, and we collided. It was pretty comical, and coke went everywhere, on her, on me, on the poor kid behind the counter, all resulting in my inevitable firing. But I was glad and didn't want to work there. I was only working there for cash. Now first, before I get into my story, and the reason you are listening to this, well, I want to get several things straight. I'm not a waste of space. I was something, at least that's what I like to tell myself. Yes, I lived with my mum, and yes, I was broke. Yes, I had no friends, and yes, I wasn't planning on getting another job, at least not yet. Instead, I wanted to bask in my own melancholy. I wanted to dwell on my potential future, which had been ripped away before I'd even got a taste of it. I'd wanted to be an actress my whole life. I grew up watching movies and musicals, and I wanted to be like them. (laughs) Who didn't? I watched Disney Channel throughout my childhood and tweens. Of course I wanted to be like Miley Cyrus and Selena Gomez. I started high school with a goal. I was going to get into a top drama school, and I was going to be famous. (laughs) Well, easier said than done. However, I was determined. I ignored the concept of friends and socializing and studied way into weeknights. I auditioned for our school show every year and managed to score the top part every time. I'd like to say I was thriving. I threw away my high school experience to get where I wanted in life, and it worked. I graduated with a 4.0 and worked in my local cafe to pay for tuition. Mom had saved up her whole life to provide me with the college experience I'd dreamed of. She moved to New York for a job, so it was ideal for both of us. Mom moved into a two-bedroom house in southern Brooklyn, and I moved into dorms. And the problem was when I actually started college. After a grueling audition, I got into the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. I was told I had talent. I was told I would go somewhere, and I believed them. I believed that I was really going to live my dream. Well, throughout high school, I barely had any competition. When a freshman came along, or a kid in my year suddenly decided that they were going to have the main parts and solos, I made sure to let them know that those parts were mine. They would always be mine, and they were fools for even trying. Oh, bitchy, I know. But if I was going to be a star, I was going to tear down my competition. At college was where everything came crashing down. I was a small town girl used to being in the spotlight. I was used to picking off my competition. In college was when reality hit me in the face. I wasn't expecting kids like me. I mean, exactly like me. Kids who were obsessed with getting that limelight that I craved. 
Kids that weren't afraid to fight each other to the death to get to the top. Crystal James was a carbon copy of me. But she was far worse. I mean, Crystal had an ego the size of a continent. Think of every mean girl-esque bitch you've seen in all those 2000s chick flicks. That was Crystal. Her goal was to get to the top, just like me. So obviously, we clashed. I'm not going to get into the details because I don't have the time, but my dream, pipe dream, ended at the New York Academy for Dramatic Arts, specifically the night of our final showcase. It was our third show, and Crystal, after drinking too much champagne, had accidentally shoved me off stage during my performance. She insisted it was a complete accident and had bumped into me. I'm not even sure what it was. I was knocked unconscious when I hit the ground and it fucked up my ankle. So I was out and Crystal was in as my understudy. And it hurt to see her play the part I'd worked so hard for. It made me think. Crystal was able to snatch up my part, barely having to lift a finger, while I was left in the dust. And weirdly enough, nobody suspected foul play. My teacher told me I was being dramatic and my classmates stuck up their noses. Better me than them. I could see it in their expressions. All they wanted was success. All they wanted was fame. So I marched, or well, I guess I limped, to the principal's office and told him I was done. I was quitting and I hoped they had a great show. They didn't try to talk me out of it. The school was full of students like me who acted just as I did, like spoiled, narcissistic children. Well, I was done with that part of me, because I realized that I hurt others to get to the top, and Karma was one hell of a bitch. And then, I spat on his desk. Well, fast forward several months, and NYADA was less of a memory and more of a fever dream. I was standing in front of a club, in a line of maybe 20 or 30 people. The music was blaring, it was my type of music. Maybe they were having an 80s night. Mamma Mia was blasting out, and the kids in line were drunkenly jumping up and down, laughing and falling over each other. My initial plan was to get wasted and see where the night would lead. I had two crumpled twenties in my pockets. I posted the rest through my mum's bedroom door for rent. I wasn't dressed for clubbing, still wearing the white cotton polo shirt I wore for work and skinny jeans. The material was sticking to my flushed skin, and the night air wasn't helping. God, it was hot for 11pm. I was expecting it to cool down, but even outside I was sweating. When the group of kids in front of me ducked into the club, their shadows swallowed by blinding disco lights, I shuffled forwards, already feeling self-conscious. It had been a spontaneous idea to go to a club, despite never going to one before. Well, I had no idea what I was doing or what I was supposed to do. All I knew was that there was music and dancing, and noise. I just needed noise to drown out those existential thoughts that were driving me mad. Where was I going to be in five years? Was I going to be homeless? Maybe I'd somehow make it big via YouTube or TikTok. I was weighing the positives and negatives of starting a YouTube channel, not really paying much attention, when a voice startled me out of my daydream, a gruff yell over the music. Mask! first I hadn't fully heard the bouncer. When I looked up to frown at him, he wore a scowl. The guy had bulky shoulders and thick dark hair, a sheen of sweat glistening light tanned skin. His shirt looked far too tight, cinched to thick, bulging arms. He was supposed to look intimidating, sure, but already in a sour mood, the guy was pissing me off. I had my ID, waving it in his face like a frenzied insect. Mask or no entry, kid. His words dawned on me and I reached into my bag, pulling out the crumpled mask my mum had stuffed in there a few hours earlier. I put it on quickly, my cheeks burning. Sorry, I managed to say, and he nodded with an eye roll. I remember it next time, he grunted. No mask, no entry. Smiling my best smile, even if it was behind my mask, I ducked into the club, joining the crowd of dancers. And it was beautiful. The lights and the music and the sweaty bodies slamming into me. Everybody wore a mask, but I still saw the glee and excitement and euphoria lit up in their eyes. Mamma Mia ended, 
quickly followed by Take On Me. And that was a song I liked. It was my mom's favourite. Nodding my head to the beat and letting myself sway to lyrics that were definitely not written to sway to, I pushed through dances until I got to the bar. Can't remember what I ordered, but after several of them and a few on the house, I started to lose myself in the music and the dancing until my head was spinning itself off its axis. When I ordered water, I was given something else. Definitely another alcoholic beverage. Well, it stung my tongue and the back of my throat. I started to feel giddy, but I knew I was going to be sick. When I had the exit in my sight, I started towards it, but someone's arm shoved me back. Then another body slammed into me, and it felt like I was flying. Colors were magnified, and the music felt like it was in my blood, like it was inside me, each lyric trying to tear its way out. I was laughing, I'm not sure what at, when I turned and found myself face to face with a small girl. She was maybe six or seven, with blonde hair pulled into pigtails. Her dress was bright pink with sequins, and in my state, that was what I focused on. How cool her dress looked in the flashing lights. Well, the girl wasn't wearing a mask. She was the only one in the club who wasn't. Her smile was bright, and blue eyes pinpointed on me. Elizabeth, the little girl shouted over the music, pointing at me. Well, the words confused me, but part of me wondered if I'd drunk so much I was hallucinating, or if I'd been roofy. Instead of doing what I really wanted to do, which was to find somewhere to bath, I found myself following the little girl, who, after doing a spin, her dress flying around her, twisted around and ran for the exit, disappearing into the grinding bodies. Looking around, nobody seemed to notice the girl except me. I wasn't thinking straight. All I cared about was seeing if I was actually losing my mind. I followed the girl, like Alice had followed the rabbit, and ended up outside the club on my hands and knees. I was barfing up my late lunch before I even knew what was happening. The world was tilted, all the colour sucked into the night. There was nobody around, only the little girl with her back to me. She turned then to face me, that bright smile still plastered across her face. Elizabeth, she shouted, bouncing up and down. You're Elizabeth. I stood up shakily, swallowing what was trying to creep back up. Hey there, I said, though my voice was slurred and strange. Well, I'd gotten drunk before, mostly at parties at college, but this was something else entirely. I could barely keep my footing. Are you okay? You seem kind of, um, lost. The girl shook her head, her hair flying around her in a whirlwind. Elizabeth! No, I'm Safi. I introduced myself and held out a hand. Though when I did, I nearly toppled over. Melanie? Are you sure it's her? Another voice hit my eardrums. This time it was a male grumble. When I twisted around, I nearly fell again, and he grabbed my arm, steadying me. There was a man in front of me. And he was tall, youngish looking, maybe late thirties. I couldn't tell because he was wearing Ray-Bans. The man seemed to size me up. <laughs> he chuckled. I mean, if you're sure, Mouths. Is that all of them? Uh-huh. The little girl giggled and made her way towards me and wrapped her arms around my lower waist. Well, she had a tight grip for how small she was. Elizabeth. Safi, I created. Sapphire, if you'd like. My words were sluggish before I barfed on the guy's fancy-looking shoes, choking on the rest of my greeting. Though, if anything, I found it funny. Sorry. Slapping my hand over my mouth, I burped, and more barf crawled up my throat, filling my mouth. I was ready to introduce the guy to what was left of my stomach lining, but before I could, I was being violently shoved backwards. I was ready to hit rough concrete, so instead my back was slamming into warm leather. The temperature changed instantly, from cool night air that had finally cooled down to somewhere inside, somewhere muggy and uncomfortable. It was a car, but that didn't hit me until it started moving and I found myself pressed against someone's back. There were others with me, 
how they were talking over each other, laughing and singing. Some guy was yelling vine quotes, and knowing them, I joined in. Well, in my mind, this was an adventure. When I managed to straighten up, I stuck my head out of the window, which was open, screaming into the night. I remember my hair was a whirlwind, hitting me in the face. I remember the air felt amazing against my clammy forehead. I think I started dancing, though. More of a sit-down, swaying kind of jig. My head was still spinning, the deluge of passing traffic sending me more and more hyper. When I thrust my elbows back, a boy's yelp ricocheted in the back of my mind. Ow! Who raised you, animals? I felt movement. Sticky, sweaty skin against mine. I was greeted by a mouthful of his hair which smelled and tasted like cheap axe spray and watermelon. Ignoring him, I focused on the cool air whipping in my face. Behind me, a girl and another guy were laughing together, and I felt a sense of solidarity. I mean, I'd never had friends, only rivals who I pretended were friends. But at that moment, with my head in the clouds and my stomach in my throat, I felt like the strangers next to me were something else. I couldn't even see their faces properly. I saw glimpses every time a car flew past, blinding us in dizzying light. Yeah, there were two boys and a girl. At the front, the same man whose shoes I'd bathed on, and next to him sat the little girl who twisted in her chair and was singing along with the others. Reveling in my spinning head and twirling thoughts, I let my head sag against the window. The others were still shouting over each other, and none of us realized where we were. Where? We were going. I started sobering up when the laughter and shouting faded into murmurs and giggles, and then they stopped altogether. The boy next to me was snoring, his head on my shoulder. I was tired, my body, my limbs, every part of me screaming for me to let myself slip into darkness. But the car was picking up momentum. We were on a highway. Slipping in and out of awareness, I remember the car door opening and someone pulling me out. I remember stumbling forwards and almost slipping into water. Cool, refreshing water. It sparkled beneath me, underneath a crescent moon. My feet were bare, though. I wasn't sure when I'd taken my shoes off. I remember being escorted onto a boat. Oh, I marveled at the size. Not exactly ferry-sized, but it was the type the 1% own. You know, the elite. We were escorted on board. Nobody was complaining or protesting. I was aware of what was going on, but I couldn't do anything. I couldn't speak or cry out. I couldn't fully move my body. It wasn't the effects of alcohol. No, it was something else. Something that paralyzed my limbs. I lay down on the deck and searched for stars in the darkness above me. And when the sky lightened, I watched the sun rise blur of cotton candy pink and white spreading across the horizon. It was only when the first glimpses of the sun were appearing, reflecting in ocean waves lulling us back and forth, when I realized my hands were tied behind my back. Even riding between half drunk and sober, panic filled me like poison. I managed to sit up, but my body flopped back down again, like it refused to comply. Hello? My voice was a whimper. When I twisted my head to the left, the others were lying next to me, fast asleep. I finally got a proper look at them. The boy next to me had chestnut hair and pale skin, glitter speckling his cheeks. He lay on his back, his eyes shut, lips parted peacefully. Next to him was a girl with shoulder-length red hair and a guy with dirty blonde curls peeking from a baseball cap. They were in club wear, T-shirts covered in sweat stains and jeans. The girl had a heart painted on her left cheek, mascara smeared under her eyes. Their shoes had been taken too. I nudged the guy next to me, but he didn't respond. When I tried to scream, my voice came out hoarse and just wrong. Time went by slowly, and I spent it staring at the clouds, trying and failing to wrench myself out of my restraints. My wrists were stinging when footsteps sounded. They were gentle, almost like a dog's, pitter-pattering on the deck. I squeezed my eyes shut, 
but when the footsteps stopped in front of me, I risked cracking them open. The little girl from the night before loomed over me with the same grin. They're amazing, she sang, dancing across the deck, twirling and doing little spins. They're so much better than the other ones. Oh, they were too old and wrinkly. I had barely enough time to register what she was saying before the girl was flicking me in the face. Elizabeth, she giggled. Fully sober now, I shook my head, but I couldn't speak. You little bitch. When I risked a glance to my left, the boy lying next to me was squirming to get up, struggling in his restraints. Did you do this? His voice was a soft croak, barely a yell. Did you freaking kidnap us? Kidnap? Another voice. The red-haired girl was squeaking, rolling around trying to get up. Her sharp cries woke the other boy up, the kid with the baseball cap. Letting out an exhalation of breath, he sat up with a groan, blinking in the sunlight. I recognized his voice. He'd been the one yelling vine quotes. Well, I'd only known his laugh and the momentary flash of his sparkling grin last night in the car. But now, he looked confused, his eyes frenzied. The little girl giggled. Freddy doesn't swear, she said, pointing to the boy next to me. If you swear, I'll make you regret it. The boy leaned back with a scowl, pulling at his bound hands. Oh yeah, he murmured, his dark eyes challenging her. What are you going to do her? Give me a dolly makeover? Cocking her head, the little girl pouted. You're mean, she said, folding her arms. I don't want you to be Freddy if you're mean. Freddy? The boy raised a brow. Her expression lit up. Yes, Freddy. He's the smart one in Mr. Pickle's gang. He unmasks all the monsters. Skipping over our legs, the girl pointed to each of us. You're Freddy and Elizabeth, she said to the boy and I, and then she danced over to the others. You're Raggy and you're Daffy. It took me a moment to register the names, though before I could speak, the red-haired girl got there first. She laughed nervously, though her eyes were wide and frantic. Are you talking about... Scooby-Doo... The boy with a baseball cap finished. She's talking about Scooby freaking do. The girl lost her smile. Her small hands clenched into fists. No, you're not listening. I was only aware of her stamping her feet on the deck, and then something was hitting me like a living entity, a shrill screeching noise slamming into my skull. The love child of a dentist drill and a fire alarm, but a thousand times worse. And her scream filled me with ice, puncturing my lungs. I found myself gasping for breath, sucking in precious oxygen, when all the wind was not from my lungs, my head slamming against the wooden deck. But I barely felt the impact. I fought my restraints, screaming into the air for mercy. All I could think about was blocking out the noise. It was going to freaking kill me. Something warm and wet slipped from my ear and I shrieked. I thought she was going to continue. I thought the crazy girl was going to blow out my brains. But when she stopped abruptly, I felt an overwhelming urge to wrap my arms around her and hug her for giving me my next breath back. It's not Scooby-Doo, the girl said with finality. When none of us answered, she stamped her foot. I said, it's not Scooby-Doo. The others were groaning, lying on their front, while, ironically, the girl was humming the What's New Scooby-Doo theme tune. What the fuck is her problem? The boy next to me hissed. I glimpsed a scarlet smear near his head. His eyes were squeezed shut, tears staining his cheeks. Well, the girl yelled, what is it called? Warm arms wound around me and pulled me to my knees. As soon as I was upright, I had to swallow vomit shooting back up. The others were yanked up too, forced to face a six-year-old's wrath. Mr. Pickles and company, she said through her teeth. 
Repeat it back to me. We did, but it wasn't loud enough. I can't hear you. She cupped her ear, a manic smile spreading across her lips. Mr. Pickles and company, we yelled back. Satisfied, she nodded, skipping over to the red-haired girl and running her small fingers through the girl's hair. She grasped a fistful and yanked hard. The redhead squeaked. If you keep making oopsies, I'll turn your tummies inside out so your wiggly wrigglies will fall out. I stayed silent after that. The boat docked at a small island. It wasn't the type from the movies where castaways get stranded. No, this island was inhabited. There's only one building and the rest is trees. We were taken to a modern looking building with glass panels and automatic doors. When I was shoved inside, an aircon blasted icy air into my face. It was a relief from the blistering heat. Well, I thought I was surprised when the others stayed quiet, but I wasn't really surprised. I was sure Wiggly Wrigley's were in fact intestines, and after being subjected to her banshee-like wail, I had no doubts the girl was capable of something as horrifying as that. Well, the building reminded me of one of those insane YouTuber mansions. Everything was pristine and perfect. We were taken up an elevator and then to a small room where a burly-looking man sat behind a desk. In front of him was a laptop and a coffee mug. When we were pushed in, he surveyed us with a smile. Well, my head was still topsy-turvy. I knew if I started talking, I'd start screaming. I'd demand to know where I was, and so I kept my mouth shut. Welcome. He nodded at us. I trust my daughter gave you a warm welcome. None of us spoke, and the man cleared his throat. Now I know you're scared, but trust me, you've all been chosen to serve a purpose. He then spread out his arms in a ta-da motion. You're going to be looking after some very special children by being their, uh, let's say, uh, entertainment. What? The boy who I christened Watermelon because of the smell of his hair said. What are you talking about? Do you even know what you've done? I mean, dude, this is freaking illegal. Baseball cap joined in. You kidnapped us to act out your daughter's Walmart version of Scooby-Doo? But the man's expression didn't waver. You have been handpicked from the top acting schools in the country. We have no doubt you will entertain our children. After all... You four are talented, are you not? Now, our kids are not your average children. They're incredibly gifted, and whatever they say, well, they get. Recently, they became quite fond of the cartoon you're referring to. We, of course, gave them what they wanted, but our originals didn't quite fit the part. The kids did uh, not like them. His gaze then flicked to me. And that is where you come in. You're kidding me, Watermelon said under his breath. Hmm, the man continued. Now, unlike cartoons and children's television, our children can bend reality however they like. If they want to get rid of uh, certain characters or change them, they can. Get rid, the red-haired girl jumped in. Do you mean... Oh, God... Do you mean kill? Oh, kill is a uh, strong word, he murmured. It's up to the children. Most of our originals were turned into monsters, or, as you would say, they were taken care of. One complaint was that they were too old. Watermelon shook his head. Oh, fuck this, he spat. We're not doing this. You can't make us. The man hummed. Please turn your attention to the screen of my laptop. I'll bring Melanie in, but she's having breakfast with the other children, so hopefully I will be able to sway you. When he turned the laptop around, I found myself staring at a video player. Clearing his throat, the man gestured to the laptop screen. Bella Therese, Ethan Dacker, Sapphire Easterbrook, and Jonas Lockhart. He addressed us. 
You all attended drama schools in New York, correct? Yeah, but I dropped out, the red-haired girl hissed out. Oh, I sucked. The man raised a brow. Ah, oh, Isabella, now, we both know that's not true. The screen flashed to a video, a boy on in the centre of the stage. He was singing a song from Wicked. It was Watermelon, and he had a voice like I'd never heard, the kind I dreamed of having. The screen flicked to the redhead, dancing a complicated routine. A confident smile spread across her perfectly made-up lips. Then another stage in another school. And this time it was baseball camp. He was on his knees reading a Hamilton monologue, his voice heavy and emotional, emphasizing every word. Oh, they were good. No, they were amazing. I'd spent most of my life obsessed with myself, and the three of them had blown me out of the park. Finally, me. I recognized the stage I'd stood on for a whole year, my circle of toxic classmates that made me want to rip my hair out. It was during our showcase, the best show I'd done, right before Crystal James had shoved me off the freaking stage. Well, thankfully, that part wasn't show. The man smiled widely. As you can see, you all excelled. It was your choice to drop out, and you were losses to your teachers. The screen flashed again. And at first I didn't know what I was looking at. Even when the others started crying out and lunging forwards only to be dragged back by the guard standing behind us. And then I was looking at my mother. She was sitting in our tiny living room, her hands tied behind her back, a gun pressed into the flesh of her temple. When I screamed, the man looked satisfied. Now I'm fairly sure we have a deal. You make our kids happy and your loved ones continue on in their daily lives. Well, I didn't realize how gifted our audience really were until we started. I wore a bright orange dress and knee-high socks. When I was handed glasses to put on, I shook my head. I don't need them. I'd managed to get it out. I had 20-20 vision and I've never needed glasses. Melanie popped her head into the room, wearing her usual grin. She waved a hand in front of my face. How many fingers? She was holding up five, but the longer I stared at them, my vision began to blur. It was like losing a piece of me. My sight. When I stumbled back, Melanie slid the pair of glasses onto my face, and I could see perfectly. Horrified, I'd taken them off, but... I couldn't see without them. She'd taken my sight. Melanie had taken my freaking sight. It wasn't just me. When our small group were forced in front of a dozen children gathered together, Jonas sprouted dark red hair out of nowhere when a small boy glared at him. Bella grew a foot taller, her hair turning silk blonde, a red headband flashing into existence on her head. When Ethan's feet lifted from the floor and he let out a shriek, the children laughed in delight. Melanie was at the front. Freddy has superpowers. He has what? Well, the boy struggled to stay in the air, though the kids helped him, lifting their hands and turning them clockwise. Ethan was able to float across our heads, though he was kicking his legs. Please, get me, get me down! When I pulled off my first mask as Elizabeth Silly, my fingers curled under a real person's skin. And I pulled. I pulled and pulled until the ghost mask lifted, along with the face. Well, the others didn't react after several times of this. We became desensitized to it. It became the norm. But the thing beneath kept talking. Meddling kids, they growled. I would have got away with it if it wasn't for... Mr. Pickles. The four of us laughed. Jonas patted the head of some poor dog. It was our fourth Mr. Pickles. And I got good at laughing. I got good at hiding my screams behind my over-the-top giggles as Elizabeth Silly. 
It wasn't until right at the end of our final episode of Season 2 when I stopped laughing. I stopped smiling. I stopped fucking trying. Bella's character had turned to the bad side. She'd become an evil ghost person, and Mr. Pickles and company had to stop her. We had to stop her. Oh God, we had to stop her. We read our lines from a monitor hanging from the ceiling. In outdoor scenes, it's displayed on a table. Raggy. Oh, you're a bad person, Daffy. Mr. Pickles is very upset with you. And when Ethan read this line, his voice caught. He was already reading the stage directions underneath. Stepping forward with a smile, our hero Freddy reaches into Daffy's chest and pulls out her heart. Her evilness is gone. Once again, Mr. Pickles and company have saved the world. No, Ethan whispered, stumbling back. No, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Bella didn't move. There were tears in her eyes. Her fists were clenched at her sides. Do it, she gritted out. I knew after what she'd seen that she was tired. Bella wanted out. And then as Daffy. Go on, Freddy. I dare you. We all knew Ethan was capable of it. He was the season's superhero, after all. Ethan had been turned into a freak... A Captain America slash Peter Parker, whatever the fuck he was, by these psycho children. I don't know why Ethan did what his line said. I'll still never know why he followed the script and Bella's words. I don't want to say what happened to Bella. I don't want to write it because I can still see it. I can see, still, Ethan's fingers puncture her chest and whatever reality that I was clinging on to collapsed. Bella's heart looked almost cartoonish in Ethan's hand, a pulpy mass of scarlet squelched between his fists. Well, Bella is dead. I watched him pull out her heart from her chest like it was, well, like it was easy. And so another Bella has been brought in. She came last night, screaming and crying, we were all kept in a glass cage overnight. It's barely big enough for two people, never mind four. We don't have beds. We give them basic food and water. And the little brats make visits every night. They press their faces against the glass and giggle, pointing and laughing. When Ethan tells them to fuck off, they take his voice. When I cry, they take my tears. To them... We're just zoo animals. I managed to grab a guard's phone this morning. I can't call anyone, but I can put out some kind of call for help. I don't know where we are. There's no name of this island. At least, I haven't heard one. Just call my school. Tell them Sapphire Easterbrook needs help. Call the police. You're our only chance. Oh, the amount of power these kids give off... I'm not surprised I'm able to connect to some kind of network. You need to get help. I don't want to keep playing Elizabeth silly. I can't. I won't. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.